Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are continuing in the book of Acts. We will be in chapter 21. So grab your Bibles, your highlighter, cup of coffee, and sit down. Take a rest. I know it's early morning. You don't really need a rest yet. <laughs> you may have just woke up, so take a couple of sips of your coffee mm. and, and let's pray. And let's just be encouraged by God's word today. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to just gather in your holy name, Lord. Thank you for the grace that you have given to us, Lord. Thank you for opening up our eyes to the mystery of the gospel message, Father. And I do pray, Lord, for those that are still yet blinded uh, to that mystery of what Jesus has done in his birth, his death, and resurrection, Lord. And I also pray for believers, Lord, who have partial blindness, Lord. Uh, they, they see clearly his, his birth, his death, his resurrection, Lord, but yet, uh, Father, there are some areas where they're still dimly blinded. They're either farsighted or nearsighted, and they don't quite see the importance of being holy. They don't quite see the importance of attending church or fellowshipping or being a part of the body of Christ in a more intimate way and deeper way, Lord. And so I do pray for them, Lord, lovingly and caringly, Lord, in hopes that they'll come uh, to the realization of what Jesus really wants. And, and Lord, lead them to read Acts chapter 2, very clearly what the early church did there. And it's what God wants us to do in the various bodies throughout our world, Lord. Minister to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Glad you guys are joining us here this morning. All right, we're in Acts chapter 21, and we're continuing on with the travels of the Apostle Paul as he's on mission journeys. He's actually returning to Jerusalem, and the Lord is going to begin to use him uh, in the latter part of his life to minister not just to the Gentiles, but also to the political leadership of that time in Rome to Caesar himself, the, the seeds will be planted and watered uh, because of the Apostle Paul and, and then eventually lead to Constantine, who is a ruler who will make Christianity a, a religious uh, government system. And this will open up the door for the rest of the world and Christianity today, whether through Catholicism or, or not. Uh, I still believe and do believe historically that Catholicism and Protestantism uh, went two different directions, where Catholicism went more into the political area, the government area, and you see it throughout the medieval times, the kings and so forth. And Protestantism <clears throat> was always behind the scene battling uh, for the truth of the word of God. So be that as it may, uh, Paul was instrumental in, in all of that as the gospel was being spread. So let's go ahead and, and look at... Uh, Chapter 21, it says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes and from there to Petra. So again, remember, uh, Paul is traveling back to uh, Jerusalem and he's hitting various places there. So he's finding, and verse 2 says, And finding a ship sailed over to um Phoenicia, uh, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted uh, Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyra. For there the ship uh, was to upload her cargo. Now, there was a trade uh, route that they would use in the ship. And it would oftentimes run close to the coast as they sailed through that area there through Sicilia and then eventually to Italy and so forth. And so they just followed that same trade uh, course uh, constantly. And especially during storms, they would have oftentimes have to sail a little farther out or closer and adjust themselves during the storms. And we'll see that later on when Paul gets shipwrecked because they had to sail part the port and then get on a ship and, and sail in a different direction there. So the life of the ministry, right? The life of a missionary. 
is always being led by the Holy Spirit. You, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, you have to just trust in God. And I think that there's, there is some application there for us today because we live a life uh, of Christianity in this world. And in a sense, we're all missionaries, persons that have been sent out by God to live our Christian life in the area where we're at, in our homes, in our little neighborhood, in our churches, in our community, as you meet people. And you just never know what the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to. And sometimes it's great blessings and you get the opportunity to share the gospel with people, share the love of Jesus Christ with people, make new friends uh, and create intimacy with them, with your children and so forth. And it is a great opportunity to plant seeds and to water. Uh, yet we also see in life the hardships of life, right? Where we struggle maybe uh, with somebody in our family that's not a believer. And so we struggle with that relationship because it's a constant battle. It's a fighting to go to church and participating in, in Christian ministry. Or maybe it's just the finances and the difficulties and you're at a point where you're losing things. And, and now you're realizing uh, how much you are attached to those material things and God is taking them away to let you know that he's the center of your life and that material things are are vanishing and perishing and you don't need those material things as much as you need him so just like a missionary our lives are you know governed by the moving of the Holy Spirit and I really do believe the application would be is be faithful trust in God keep your eyes on Jesus and don't let go because you'll be in that sailboat and the waves will toss you to and fro, but you have to keep your eyes on the plan of God and the destination that he has you on, which is heaven. We're all heaven bound, right? Amen. We're all going to heaven. So, so he sails uh, and unloads the cargo. And finding disciples, verse 4, we, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through, through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So as they're praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, the Spirit tells them not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, does Paul listen? Is Paul obedient to that? Not necessarily. The Spirit may be saying that, but Paul has a mission and possibly um, a call from the Spirit himself to go in a different direction. I find that interesting that sometimes we we, we, we contradict each other. You know, I feel that you shouldn't go. And well, I feel like the Spirit's leading me to go. And those are those times of conflict where, where we have to just personally ourselves, we have to go in the direction that we feel God is directing us and not necessarily what someone else says. And, and if we're being directed by the Holy Spirit uh, to direct someone else, then we need to be very cautious that um, it is the Holy Spirit and that um, it's just not us thinking that we should direct them, uh, but give them that leeway to make that decision in their own direction in life. So, so they're saying, don't go up to Jerusalem. But when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boated the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyra, we came to um, Ptolemies, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. And on the next day, we, who were Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Uh, now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now, we see uh, something interesting here, God using women in the ministry, giving them the gift of prophecy. And, and these young virgin daughters are anointed by the Holy Spirit, and they were able to give prophecy probably to the Apostle Paul. We don't know what they, they prophesied here yet, but um, the Lord uh, used them in that way. So God does use women, and, and those that, those that um, say that the Bible has kept women oppressed— you know, and not liberated them, it's not true. The Bible is filled with women that were used by God in mightily ways. And we have an example here of four beautiful young ladies who were the daughters of Philip, who was an evangelist, and obviously he poured into them, trained them up in the way of the Lord, and boy, they, they have been following that path uh, to that day. And verse 10 says, as they, 
as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had <coughs> come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his, his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he had heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I love the heart of, of Paul. You know, he's not going to let anyone persuade him, even though they're his peers. And even though they're coming in the name of the Holy Spirit. And even they give an illustration of being, you know, this is what you're going into. And they were right. They were right. He's going to die. But Paul wouldn't stop. He reminds me of that young man that went and tried to minister to the Indians on that island. And they said, you shouldn't do that. You're going to die. He says, this is why I came, to die. If I'm going to give my life, then I want to give it up for something honorable, to preach the gospel to these Indians that are out there that nobody wants to go to. And he went out there and they speared him to death, dragged his body and buried it somewhere. They still haven't found it. 27-year-old young man. I remember when I first went to South Sudan, South Sudan, I prayed about missionary work. The Lord led me to uh, far-reaching ministries and I asked him about South Sudan. I asked about the dangers, talked to other people. Uh, they shared with me about their experiences, about getting sick, about the dangers. And, and I remember going to a missionaries conference and just seeking the Lord and praying if this is what the Lord wanted me to do. And every time I would bring it up to someone, because they'd ask, well, where are, you, where are you a missionary to? I go, no, I'm not. I'm a pastor, missionary to Mariloma here, that area, to reach the people there. But this is the first time that I'm praying about a short mission trip. And I'm praying about going to South Sudan. And every time I mentioned that, they were, these were pastors, these were missionaries. And they're like, oh, are you sure you want to go there? It's like some of them, like, you're too old. You shouldn't go there. That's for younger people. You know, and they, everybody was trying to persuade me to not go. And the more they persuaded me, the more I wanted to go. I wanted to, to experience this. And I was willing, and I really felt that I was going to die there because it seemed like everything that I was praying about and the scriptures we were getting, even Virginia felt like this was it. I was going to die. This was going to be the end of my, my life for the gospel message and the training of chaplains there. Uh, even got scripture on it. I even had a little note that Virginia had written in her Bible from years past saying how uh, God will take care of the ministry uh, when, when uh, in the sense, he'll take care of the ministry if something were to happen to you, kind of note that she had written down. And so just everything just seemed like you were going to die. And so I went to die. I was expecting to die. And when I got there, I thought, and there were several moments where, where I thought this could be it. I remember one guy uh, walking towards us as we were out. They were wanting to buy some mangoes for the chaplains, and I'm standing outside, and this guy's walking, swinging a machete. And he's just walking, swinging the machete, and he's getting close to me, and I thought, oh, Lord, is this it? And so I prepared myself, you know, but he just walked right by me. And I thought maybe he could just whoop, come by and just slice me up, you know? I remember as I landed in, in uh, Uganda, and we were driving to the safe house, I remember these... Uh, party areas that were going all night. I remember seeing this one guy. You know how you can, you can see people as you're driving by and you can look at them? Well, all of a sudden I'm looking at these people and this guy's talking to a group of men and his back is towards me and all of a sudden he turns around and he literally points right at me and he follows me as I'm going by. And I got this little chilly feeling, you know, of goosebumps, like, like the enemy said, I know you're here. And I'm like, wow, this is really trippy. But I was ready to die. I was ready to give my life. Uh, I didn't realize, though, once I came back, that what the Lord intended was me to give myself up to him totally, to surrender my life, to die to self, and to not fear death. Uh, one one ch uh, chaplain there, he's at, and these guys are like commandos. They're out there with machine guns fighting, killing people, and yet ministering to those that are getting hurt. <clears throat> this one commando came up to me, and uh, he says, you want to go outside the compound? And they told us not to. And I said, yeah, I want to go out there. He goes, there's some Muslims over there. Let's go over there. And I said, let's go. He put his arm around me, 
And he said, we live together and we die together. And I thought, wow, okay, let's go. And he had his gun with him, you know, and I said, let's go. And we went out, you know, and I got that tattooed on my arm. We live together, we die together. Because that was such a memorable uh, time in my life where I realized that I was willing to give up my life for God. Physical life, you know. And so God taught me a lot through that. And, and Paul uh, is the same way here. Look, I came for this reason to die. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to give my life up for Christ. Now, why would Paul say that? Why would anyone say that? Because to the common person, they're saying, why would you do that? It makes no sense because Christ did it. He died for us. He went to the cross for us. He was willing to die for us. Why? Because he knew that he would resurrect from the dead. He knew that he would be in heaven. There is no death. It's just moving addresses from this location to a glorious location. So Paul was willing to die. So now let's go back to verse 17. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when we had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, You see, brothers, how many... Mydrids of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore do not, or therefore do what we tell you, we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So, so Paul, as he gets there to Jerusalem, there's some Jews that are still a little legalistic according to the law. They're still applying Moses' law of circumcision, uh, of vows, and, you know, staying away from certain foods. And so Paul comes in and they hear that he's to the Gentiles and he's telling them not to keep Moses' law. So they're like, wait a minute, whose side are you on? And they get in a little legalistic with Paul. And then they suggest, I think what you need to do is we got some guys here that are gonna take some vows. I think you need to take a vow with them. Shave your head and you pay for the whole thing. This way, if someone says something, we're gonna say, no, he took care of it. He paid for them to take the vows. He shaved his own head. So he's still a Jew. He still follows the purification laws of Moses. And so it was to, to bring no accusation against them. You know? And this is why Paul did it. He didn't do it because he was illegalistic, because he was appeasing them. It's one of those points where you disagree, but you go ahead and you do it anyway. Uh, not because you believe it, but because you just don't want to be a thorn in someone's side. You want to still have that opportunity to preach the gospel message, which not everyone can do. Not everyone can do. Um, I'm at a different point in my life. Earlier in my life, I would have done things differently um, when it came to weddings, funerals. I mean, I would have probably gone to them and preached the gospel. I remember going to my father-in-law's wedding I'm sorry, funeral. <clears throat> and um, they asked me to say a few words because nobody uh, had the strength to get up there and say it. So I got up there and preached the gospel. And the priest was upset at me. <laughs> so I would have done that in my earlier days. Today, I have the attitude it just doesn't work. At least for me, in my place where I'm at, I've preached out my heart to everyone that I've loved and cared about in Virginia's family, my family, and so forth. And so my heart has been preached out. The seeds have been planted, and now it's up to the Lord to bring the increase. And so today, I won't, I won't go to a funeral. Let the dead bury the dead, as the Bible says, you know. Uh, there's no need to. They're not there anymore. Sandy's funeral, you know, she's in heaven. She's present with the Lord. For me to go to a Catholic funeral and, and, and to agree with that at this point in my life and say that she's in purgatory and we have to pray her into heaven, uh, that's just, that's hypocritical of the scriptures and it's hypocritical of what Sandy believed. She believed in Jesus Christ. She believed in heaven. And she shared with me several times, I can't wait to get there. I wonder what it's going to be like. 
So she knew, she understood. And for Christians to approve of something like that, I disapprove of that. You know, I disagree with that. But that's my opinion. And they have the liberty of, of doing so, uh, if that's what they want to do. But at this point in my life, you know, I'm not like Paul here where, where um, he was willing to shave his head and stuff. I'm not willing to do that anymore at this point in time. So he continues on and he shaves his head and he walked orderly. But concerning the Gentiles who believed, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So he kept it completely, uh, this vow. Um, and then they made a, an amendment, I guess, <laughs> to their faith and said, look, if they're Gentiles, we just need them to be pure. We need to ask them not to continue to worship idols and not to be participating in sexual immorality, and that should be fine. They don't have to follow Moses' law. And by the way, that's good for all of us. That's good for all of us. All of us should heed to those principles. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in a temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, that is Paul, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man, Paul, who teaches all men everywhere against the people of the law in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. Now, this is totally untrue. He has not done these things in their line just like they lied about Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done. Oh, Jesus said he did destroy this temple. That's insurrection to Pilate. That's insurrection to the Roman government. And he said he'll destroy this temple, that his kingdom's not of this world, and he's going to bring his own army. So they're just lying, and they're lying about Paul now bringing Greeks into the temple. Paul wouldn't do that. For they had previously seen uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Isn't that interesting? How our minds work and they assumed jumping to supposition you know well we saw Paul in the city with this guy so he had to have brought him into the temple that's not true you didn't see him in the temple no but he was hanging around Paul so Paul probably brought him into the temple probably now no he, he was there and their buddies their pals why wouldn't he bring him into the temple and they're making this up they're making this up kind of like what we do you know that guy doesn't like me you know he doesn't like me at all so how do you know? Oh, because he didn't let me do this. So because he didn't let you do that, he doesn't like you. You don't know that. It's all supposition. You know, we do that. We assume things when they're not true. It's better just to not assume. Better to not assume and just leave people alone um, than assume things. Assumptions are that, just assumptions. We do that at work, right? <clears throat> the CEO of this company hates us. <laughs> how do we know that? Well, because he won't give us a raise. We didn't get our 2% this year, which is uh, a little bit under what, what has uh, been the norm for this year, according to the, you know, whatever scales they use. So he doesn't like you because of that. How about he's trying to do his job, like save the company money, put more money in his pocket. You know, that's his job. That's what he wants to do. It's not that he doesn't like you. You know, obviously you have a job here, so maybe he does like you. And you get paid every two weeks, don't you? Yeah, so maybe he does like you. No, you got a job to do, do it. Uh, and who cares whether he likes you or not? Just do your job, collect your money, go home, pass goal, buy a house or two, you know, and enjoy life. But don't worry about who likes you or who doesn't like you. Uh, assumptions. <clears throat> and so they assumed because they saw Paul hanging around this guy. So all the city was disturbed and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar and immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw this commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Can you imagine that? It's crazy. They take Paul, they drag him out of just, you know, Paul's probably talking with something, grabbing it. They're like, what's going on? He's being tossed all over the ground. They're beating him on the ground, you know, to a pulp. I mean, to a pulp like they did Jesus. You know, and the word's getting out. The commander, what's going on? The commanders get their swords and shields and put it on. They're running. And they, as soon as they see him, they stop. 
from beating him. So Paul's beaten up pretty badly there. It's a commotion. And a commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and asked who he was and what he had done. And some of the multitude cried one thing and some another. And when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult or the disturbance, he commanded him to be taken to the barracks. And when he reached the, star, the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. I mean, he literally probably had broken bones, bruised ribs, and all of that stuff. He just couldn't walk. And for the multitude of the people followed after him, crying out, away with him. And as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? And he replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not an Egyptian who came uh, some time ago, raised an insurrection and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Where did he get that? <laughs> he assumed too that Paul was an Egyptian. And Paul said to him, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, a Sicilian, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. Boy, that got his attention. I'm a citizen. That means I'm a Roman citizen. And that commander realized, oh, oh, I'm in trouble if this gets out. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, and we'll stop there. And we'll see what he says next week. And Paul was brilliant. Paul was brilliant, guys. He was brilliant because he's going to use the Pharisees and the Sadducees' differences uh, to cause him to think about the resurrection. He didn't purposely want to pin them up against each other, but he sure did do it by his words. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things, well, I don't think I need to mention it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> when you are biblically literate, you realize that you have some truth that not everyone's going to agree with. And when you begin to share that truth, you're going to split people apart, even Christians, because they're not biblical, biblically illiterate. And I'm not saying that you have, you're an elitist or anything. You just have the truth. And you want to share that truth with people, and not everyone's going to receive it. Uh, and you'll split family members. You'll, you'll split Christians apart. You know? I remember uh, last year, got split apart all because of the wall all because of the wall you know i'm for the wall i'm sorry i'm for the wall i think illegal aliens whether you're portuguese russian or german or hispanic should go through the process that's what it's there for that's what i think and everyone else has walls so keep us out so we should have walls but i'm not for cruelty to children i'm not for cruelty for uh, to parents or families at all. And I think the evidence is that we give out food here to a lot of people. Uh, we help people and we go beyond what we even have here. And sometimes it hurts us. So that's evident. And this one individual says, well, I disagree with you. That wall, blah, 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 blah. You're cruel and mean to families. I'm not, I'm not cruel and mean to families. We're talking about the wall. We're not talking about families. And they couldn't see that. Their, their hatred for the president and for the wall was so overwhelming that they couldn't see the fact that we as a church helped out families and loved families. And it divided us. It divided us. And that person no longer comes here because of it. You know? But yet they like it when we feed people because we'll see them on, I'll see them on Facebook and they like those posts when we're giving people out food and we're helping them here and doing this and that. And they like it. They love it. You know? But they can't stand the fact that you disagree with them against the wall. Isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. We, can't, uh, we, we cannot think for ourselves. Everyone wants to think for us. And we need to let people think for themselves. If that's what they believe, wonderful, great. Let them think that way. But love them in the Lord. And allow them to have that liberty you know, in Christ Jesus. And the liberty in this world. Because people are, are free to believe what they want. You can believe what you want. It may send you to hell, but you can believe what you want. You have that right. And I respect that completely. And we should respect that completely. But they should also respect our beliefs and what we believe, too, to be true. Um, it should go both ways. So Paul's going to use it. You watch next week or this coming Wednesday when we 
hit chapter 22. Thank you for joining us in Viewing Devo 30. God bless you. Have a wonderful day today. Uh, let's pray and we'll say goodbye. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your, your grace and your mercies, for your word, Lord, and the challenges this morning, Lord. We pray that you give us wisdom today to live, Lord, and may you bless us throughout our day. Lead us and guide us, Father, uh, and direct our footsteps, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.